down in our current situation and are only examining our own thoughts and feelings. But we need to realize that the Lord Jesus is encouraging us to rise up and come out of our low situation to be with him. He tells us that the winter has passed and the rain is over and gone. This is because he has dealt with all our problems on the cross. These trials and testings are behind us because of the Lord's abiding presence. Flowers, singing, and the voice of the turtle dove indicate the flourishing riches of Christ's resurrection. When we sing, we are in resurrection, but whenever our mouth is closed, we are in winter. May we rise up and come out so we may not hinder the Lord's way in us. Rise up. The rain is over. 
My apologies, I forgot to handle the mic. My name is Ralph Wigenet, and as one of Daniel and Paula Shepherds at Grace Evangelical Free Church of La Mirada, and on behalf of their families, I would like to welcome you and thank you all for choosing to be a part of this momentous day in their lives. Of all the honored guests at this occasion, the most special, the most honored, will be the Lord God Almighty, our Heavenly Father and loving Savior. So let us pray. Lord, we invite you to take the place of honor at this wedding, to think that the God who designed, created, sustains, and rules the entire universe and who dwells in absolute purity and holiness would bring his glory to this service is a most astonishing thought. Loving Father, thank you for being here with us. May we all have a deep sense and appreciation of your power, your presence, your goodness, and your love. Throughout this ceremony, would you remind us of your love for us through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? Would you remind us that we were created for your glory? Would you strengthen existing marriages in this place as we are reminded of the sacredness of marriage and of marriage vows? Would you use this time to show us all anew how much you love us? We know that this favor is ours only through the grace of Jesus Christ, so it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Who gives this woman to be married to this man? Father. Father does. Thank you. Okay, you may be seated, please. Go, go get her. Uh-huh. Okay, we are here in this Christian marriage ceremony recognizing that marriage was created by God as a precious gift to humanity. The Bible commands that marriage be honored among all people. Therefore, no one should enter this state of life lightly, but reverently and in the fear of God. At the beginning of the Bible, in the first marriage, when Adam discovered Eve, he said, This at last is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. So intimate is this oneness between man and woman that in the New Testament it is used to illustrate the intimacy between Christ and the church. He brings man and woman together with distinct ways of relating to each other so that a husband represents the love Christ has for his bride, the church, and a wife, the love and submission Christ's church has for Christ. In this covenant, a man and woman willingly bind themselves together for life and become one so that the world will get a glimpse of his love for us in Christ. In light of this wonderful and sobering reality, let us reverently and joyfully join with Daniel and Paula as they make their vows and embark together on this new life. Daniel, will you have this woman to be your wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holiest state of matrimony? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep only unto her so long as you both shall live? I will. Paula, will you have this man to be your wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Will you love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, keep only unto him as long as you both shall live? I will. Mm Mm-hmm. And to you, the people who are gathered here together to witness this ceremony, um, will you do whatever you can to uphold these two persons in their marriage, encouraging and equipping them as far as you are able to live out their vows faithfully and joyfully together? If so, please respond by saying, we will. We will. Uh, (laughs) All right, please stand as we sing together the hymn, And Can It Be? The words you'll find in the programs that you've been given.
Be seated. Okay. Who will be doing the reading? Who's the scripture reading? Am I? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Our scriptures will be from, first of all, the Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is strong as death. Jealousy is fierce as the grave. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of the Lord. Then we have Ephesians chapter 5. I'll be reading verse 25, followed by verses 22 through 23. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. 
And finally, Revelation 21, verse 2 and verse 6b. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And to the thirsty, I will give from the spring of water, of the water of life, without payment. Uh, Daniel and Paula, you've made it. <laughs> No small thing in this season, eh? in the midst of a season of COVID-19 and personal struggles and political uncertainty, you've come to this place to be united to each other, to make binding promises of loyalty and faithfulness to one another. But, you know, one wonders, how is it that we dare to make such promises to another person in such an uncertain time? You know, promises imply confidence in the future, that we will have the resources, the ability, and the desire to do what we say, and that the situation in which we find ourselves in the days to come will allow us to fulfill these promises. But why would we make such weighty promises, and how can we be confident that we can fulfill them when so much around us is in flux? Well, one of the reasons we make these weighty promises is that love demands them. In the passage that we just heard, uh, we just read uh, from Song of Solomon, we hear one of the lovers demanding of the other, set me like a seal on your heart. And they're saying, as if it were to, to say, I want a permanent place in your affections. This is what the lover says, right at the center of your soul, with uncontested supremacy over any other earthly love you may have. So why did they demand this? And they answer that question, because love is as strong as death. Extravagant language like this is commonplace in describing love. And you just read the Valentine's Day cards that are in the racks at the stores right now, and you'll find plenty of similar language. Love demands this kind of language, but we know in our hearts that our love isn't nearly strong enough to defeat death. There's only one love that is this strong, and that's the love of God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead to eternal life. Because we are made in the image of God, your love for each other is patterned after the love of the God, that God the Father has for his Son and for his people. And so is described in the language that is appropriate for the love of God, even if we only approach a love like this by the grace of God. We still use the language that describes the love of God to describe our own love for each other. And then the lover in the Song of Solomon goes on to say, Jealousy is as fierce as the grave. Its flashes are the very flame of the Lord. And so a jealous affection is one that, exclaims an, that claims an exclusive right to the corresponding affection of the beloved. So we tend to think of jealousy as a bad emotion, for it's commonly associated with either a husband who falsely suspects that his wife is being unfaithful to him, or with a child who is jealous of the attention that a new baby is receiving from their parents. But proper jealousy isn't suspicious, and it doesn't demand things to which it has no right. A good jealousy is a refusal to share with someone else something that should be kept for oneself alone. God's jealousy, for example, as it described in the Song of Solomon, is the flame of the Lord, is his jealous requirement that we respond to his love for us by worshiping him alone, and that we refuse to share that worship with anyone or anything else. And this may feel rather uncomfortable to people who want the right to offer themselves in worship to other things besides God, or, but it is God's right as our Creator and Lord to demand our fidelity to Him. And because your love for each other is patterned, again, on God's love for us, it is your right to require of each other the fidelity that you'll be promising as you make these vows. Though the world will call you, in a thousand ways to share this intimacy and loyalty that you are pr promising to each other with a third party, that must never be allowed. For like your love for God, your love for each other is a jealous love that is never to be shared, whether it be, it be with a coworker, a family member, or an image on a screen. They are off limits because your love is for each other and for no one else. But this may sound awfully difficult and constraining, and as a matter of fact, it is. But good things are. If you want to play good music on a piano, you can't simply walk up to the piano and hit whatever key you want in any fashion you want. That's the music of a three-year-old or your pet cat if he walks across the keyboard. Um, but good music requires that you have to work hard to learn how to press the right keys at the right time in the right way. 
And if you want to play soccer well, you can't simply kick the ball whenever you want, wherever you want, whenever it comes to you. That's the kind of soccer you see in kindergarten AYSO. Um, but instead, you have to work hard to learn how to kick the ball in the right direction, in the right way, at the right time. Good athletes and good musicians know that to do their craft well, they must submit themselves to the requirements of the craft. Likewise, if you want to do any relationship well, especially if you want to do marriage well, you must work hard to learn how to submit yourself to the requirements of the relationship. So in the passage of the book, from the book of Ephesians that we just read, God shows us how we are to submit ourselves as husband and wives to the requirement of marriage as he ordained it. And here the apostle tells us that mar the marriage relationship is patterned after the relationship of Christ and his church, where the husband is to imitate Jesus Christ and the wife is to imitate the church. Husbands, as they imitate Jesus Christ, are to love their wives in the same way that Christ loved the church. The first thing that needs to be said here is that no man is an adequate imitation of Jesus Christ in his love for his wife. We're just not that good. We are all like, rather more like kindergartners dressing up in their dad's clothes with huge shoes that barely stay on our feet and a shirt that hangs down to us on the floor. I mean, it's, it's, it's just too big for us otherwise. Jesus surpasses us completely. But nevertheless, that is the standard to which we are called to strive after, to love Jesus as sacrificial, to love our wives as sacrificially as Jesus loved his church and to do so hopefully, with the encouragement of our wives. In seeking to measure up to this standard, we husbands must strive to submit ourselves to God's purpose for us, as Jesus submitted to God's purpose for him in the Garden of Gethsemane. There is he faced the prospect of being brutally beaten and killed so that he might bear for his church the punishment for their sins. Jesus had to wrestle to submit to God's purpose for him. While God will never call us to suffer for our wives to the extent that Jesus suffered for his church, we will likely find ourselves still at times struggling to imitate Jesus by saying to God, not my will, but what you will, as he calls us to love and serve our wives. Often that struggle will be over small things, like being willing to simply listen to her talk without trying to fix anything, or being willing to get up at 2 a.m. to care for a cranky baby. But whether the issue is relatively minor or it's a major family crisis. It's your responsibility, Daniel, to, in every situation, to love Paula as Christ loved the church by saying to God, not what I will, but what you will. Amen. When he calls upon you to provide her with the good that she needs from you. The self-forgiving love that we, that we sang about in the hymn, And Can It Be, where Christ left his throne to die for us, is to be your model that Paula might be set free from her burdens, even as Christ delivered us from the burdens of sin and death. And you, Paula, as you imitate the church, you are to submit to Daniel's leadership in your marriage as though you were submitting to Jesus Christ. Of course, Daniel is not Jesus Christ. And sometimes following his lead may not feel very much like following Jesus. It may feel at times more like dancing with a partner who keeps on tripping over your feet. <laughs> more likely than not. <laughs> But Daniel's the partner you've chosen, and God has given you for the dance of marriage. And your job is not to take over the lead from him if you don't like where he's leading you, um, but to strengthen and encourage him as he seeks to grow into the role that he has been given in your marriage. And the two of you are not alone in pursuing this, for your friends here who have joined you in this ceremony have committed themselves to supporting you and Daniel as you strive to make your marriage as good as it can be. They, along with your church family, are like coaches in a football team, ready when you come off of the field after a difficult and exhausting battle to strengthen and encourage and equip you to return to the field to fight together for the welfare of your family. For you are never to be each other's adversaries. Your true adversary is the devil, and it is against him that you will need to fight. Him and his allies to, you will the, will be the battle to preserve and strengthen your relationship with each other and the health of your family. And these things are worth preserving. Marriage is a thing to be honored and preserved, for God gave it to us as both an illustration of how he relates to us and the means by which a strong, loving environment can be created and which children can be born and raised. 
A family should be the place where children receive the loving care of their mother and father who love each other and are committed to the welfare of their children. Each of you will bring your own strengths to the table in this process, and the contributions that each of you make will be needed. But child raising is not by God's grace a one-way street where your children take and take and take, leaving you empty. Each of you will find as you raise children that there are joys in the process that you could not have imagined ahead of time. You will learn important things about yourselves, each other, and God that you could not have learned in any other way. Beyond what you, you learn here, you will learn things about God as you work to preserve and strengthen your relationship with each other. We all know that God is faithful to us. We learn something about what that means by learning to live faithfully with each other. We all know that God loves unlovely people. We learn a little of what that means by learning to love each other when we are not at our best. And we husbands learn just how much God has condescended to us by choosing to be called father and not parent and not the force when we compare his perfect love, wisdom, knowledge, and power with our own very imperfect displays of these virtues. Our wives may learn this lesson as well as they watch us. But more important than all these things, important though they are, in marriage, we learn beautiful things about the love that God has for us and the wonderful future that he makes available to us. When Jesus taught people, he repeatedly referred to a, a great wedding feast to which his people were invited. And in the passage in Revelation, which we read, we hear it very briefly described. The author, there the author of Revelation said, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the point of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, to make for himself a holy city, namely his church, to be his bride. This city is further described in another passage as having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel. She is seen coming down from God to be present to the groom, who is Jesus. So what we saw today as you, Paula, were brought down the aisle by your father to Daniel was not merely a nice tradition. It was a true but small and limited representation of what we as believers can look forward to in the culmination of history. In your beauty, Paula, you represent to us what the church will be like on that day. While your father represented God as he brought you to Daniel, who represents Jesus. And at the risk of stretching the analogy a bit, we might even say that your brother-in-law represented the Holy Spirit. <laughs> In any case, what you have shown us here is a tiny foretaste of what awaits all believers in heaven. A celebration filled with beauty joy, and anticipation. Nothing at all like our cartoon images of bored angels standing in clouds strumming harps. Amen. And this, by God's grace, will be just the beginning. God hasn't brought you this far to say, good job and good luck, and then give you a push into the future and wave farewell. Yeah. He, more than any of us here, will be with you in all that you do. He will be in your joys to deepen them and in your struggles to make them fruitful. To echo the Apostle Paul, I am sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in both of you in this wedding will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Until then, press on in anticipation. Receive the good that God gives you with gratitude and use it faithfully for his good purposes. Receive the challenges he sets before you with hope, knowing that with the challenges, God supplies water from the spring of life to sustain your souls and that he works everything, even the tough stuff, for the good of people like yourselves who love him and are called according to his purposes. God will be with you wherever you go, and we will come alongside as opportunities permit to help you make your marriage and your family one that glorifies God, brings you delight, and reveals to us something of the wonder of God's goodness for us. Will you now make your vows to one another? We will. Uh, we will. That was a question. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. If you can give your flowers to the... Can, can you give your flowers to there? Okay, good. Okay. Not yet, um, because this, is th 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 this will be... Uh, okay. Actually, you can hold hands now. It's okay. Okay, Paula. By the power of the Holy Spirit, and then repeat... Uh, sorry, repeat after me. By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. 
in accordance with the grace of our Lord Jesus. In accordance with the grace of our Lord Jesus. To the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. I Paula take you Daniel. I Paula take you Daniel. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better for worse. For better for worse. For richer for poorer. For richer for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. Or the Lord returns. Or the Lord returns. According to God's holy plan. According to God's holy plan. And with God's gracious help. And with God's gracious help. And Daniel, the same. By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. In accordance with the grace of our Lord Jesus. In accordance with the grace of our Lord Jesus. To the glory of God the Father. To the glory of God the Father. I, Daniel, take you, Paula. I, Daniel, take you, Paula. To be my wedded wife. To be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold <laughs> for, from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. Or the Lord returns. Or the Lord returns. According to his holy, God's holy plan. According to God's holy plan. And with God's gracious help. And with God's gracious help. <laughs> <laughs> Who has the rings? Right here. And we are armed. Okay. Do you give one to Dan Daniel? Okay. Each of you will. Okay. <laughs> Daniel. Indicating your responsibility to Paula to receive her into your care and keeping, place this ring on her finger as both a symbol and a promise that you receive her. So you can repeat after me these. Paula, this ring I give you. Paula, this ring I give you. As a constant reminder. As a constant reminder. Of my abiding love and commitment to you alone. Of my abiding love and commitment to you alone. Okay. Got it. And Paula. Paula, indicating your responsibility to Daniel to receive him into your care and devotion, place this ring on his finger as both a symbol and a promise that you receive him. Now I'll turn two pages. Uh, repeat after me. Daniel, this ring I give you. Daniel, this ring I give you. As a constant reminder. As a constant reminder. Of my abiding love and commitment. Abiding love and, and commitment, commitment to you alone. To you alone. All right. Okay, so to symbolize and celebrate this marriage, Daniel and Paul have chosen to take communion together. So, let's see, the, the items are up there, and you can go and do that. They have chosen to take their very first communion as husband and wife in your presence to acknowledge the place that their spiritual commitments will continue to have in their new life together. In observing communion, we are remembering that Jesus Christ and we're remembering Jesus Christ and all that he has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 11:24 says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When we observe communion, we are also showing our participation in the body of Christ. His life becomes our life, and we become members of each other. So 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17 says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one loaf, for we all partake of the one loaf.
Daniel and Paula, the taking of communion together, especially when remembering the life and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, ensures that we do not forget that we are all one body, one blood, and one spirit, and that the breaking of bread and the sharing of a cup is more than nourishment or the quenching of thirst, but the sharing of ourselves. So Daniel, I challenge you to make this communion a part of the spiritual relationship that you will have with your new bride. <sighs> For inasmuch as Daniel and Paula have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed this before God and have pledged their faith to each other, I pronounce that they are husband and wife together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Those whom God has joined together, let not men put asunder. Daniel, you may kiss your bride. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. And now it is our honor and joy to present to you for the very first time as husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Daniel and Paula Kerr. <laughs> Go for it. Like radiant diamonds bursting inside us, we cannot contain. Two, two together, then one second. Your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfire, singing your name. God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your design. 